Those years were busy ones with the establishment of the mentoring component of the HTI, setting up the annual HTI retreat for awardees and mentors, as well as my visits to the ATS schools around the United States advocating uh, for the hiring of the soon to be graduated first crop of HTI awardees. The end of the 1990s when the HTI came into being also marked the end of a very particular century. According to Samuel Colby, who was a director of the World Council of Churches in 2006, the 20th century has been described not only as the age of extremes or even the most violent century in history, but also as the ecumenical century. Since it was then that churches began to discover each other and committed themselves to work together in response to challenges they were confronted with. Now, this is not to say that Christian churches had never attempted to work together before, because we know that efforts across denominations can be found as early as the 1800s in this country. However, with the founding of the World Council of Churches in 1948, global Christian networks were set up to unify and coordinate the responses of the churches to the varying needs that their communities were facing. The word ecumenical comes from the Greek oikos, and the, which means house, so that oikumenico means inhabiting from the whole world, a house that is inhabited by everyone, the house being the world or the church, and it is a term of inclusivity meant to denote welcome. In the strictest sense, ecumenism among those who are Christians is no matter what Christian denomination or house you come from, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Roman Catholic, we all share the same house. So to be ecumenical in that strict sense meant to be inclusive of those outside your denominational tradition, to welcome them and to work with, and to work with them. And Peter mentions the 50 years of the first hiring of a Catholic in a Methodist university. That's an ecumenical gesture. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that all Christians believed or did they want ecumenism or did they want to be ecumenical? And the reasons for that are too long and complicated for the purpose of the science presentation. But at its, its most basic level, we can say that indeed the HTI had an ecumen ecumenical vision at its founding. The, ATA, the HTI was not a Protestant only program, but was to include Roman Catholics as well. And the HTI was not about mainline or historical Protestants only, but also included those who, for, who were further from what has been considered the Christian core of the US uh, uh, historical narrative about religion. And this was clearly manifested in the fact that the sociologist charged with writing the grant for the HTI to Pew was an Adventist, an Adventist scholar, Dr. Edwin Hernandez, who still was and is United Methodist, and I was and am an ordained minister of the Christian church. And Lizzie was also a member of the Disciples of Christ Christian Church. So from the very beginning, we were indeed an ecumenical group. However, 1996 is a quarter of a century away from where the HDI was. And it is very clear that society, the world, all of us have changed. So the question tonight that I want to pose for us is what does this ecumenical beginning mean for the 21st century reality the 21st century reality for the HTI, for its leadership, for its alums, for its mentors, and for the institutions affiliated with it. We begin by looking at where we are. The over 600,000 who died in this country due to COVID remind us constantly of the fragility of human life and how quickly societies around the world could be turned topsy-turvy in a matter of weeks. To further compound the situation, this last year was also one of great racial strife a reaction to pain and suffering caused by police brutality that made itself felt all around the nation. Joblessness became a common reality for millions of folks in this country, which led to levels of hunger and food insecurity not really seen before in our lifetime. And as if this was not enough, bringing further chaos and fear, the Trump regime continued unabated its war against immigrants coming to the United States, to the Southern border, particularly targeting children and women as well as immigrants already living here as the fate of DACA remained unresolved. And in all this time, given all these challenges, the US United States continued its merry way holding its banner as a Christian nation, when this reality is that we are living in a world of what some scholars are calling contested Christianities. What does this mean for an ecumenical organization or an organization with an ecumenical view? A contested, contested Christianities where the Christian mission some scholars claim, have been hijacked to such an extent that the terms religious and Christian, for many, 
have only become empty signifiers. And what this points to should greatly concern all of us who teach in the seminaries and school of religion, those of us who mentor students who want to teach in seminaries and departments of religion, because right before our eyes, Christianity has become a divisive force creating deep rifts between communities to such levels that for many, both outside and inside the Christian community, Christian values, practices, and beliefs have become insincere, unreliable, and even treacherous. Now, I'm not saying Christianity is going away or disappearing anytime soon, and the statistics bear this out. But what I am saying is that there is a turmoil within Christianity and the world, the oikos, the, the home, the, the, lo the location that Christianity is facing that is so changed that these challenges impact the work of organizations precisely like the HTI. So my question is, how does the HTI respond to this reality that it faces today? I also want to lift up that the world we inhabit today is one where conflict on the basis of religious identities and between religions is commonplace. Does this mean that the HCI needs to become much more engaged in interreligious dialogue and cooperation among its students and alums? Are these interreligious competencies that the HCI awardees need to acquire? I'm not just talking about changes in the ecclesial and ecumenical landscape that has and continues to occur with the growing number of Pentecostal and evangelical Christians. I'm talking about non-Christian religions. I'm talking about the plurality, plurality of religion and faiths in today's society and how a new generation of Latinx scholars are being prepared to engage them in their classrooms, in their scholarship, and in the work related to multi-religious approaches to justice issues. The need exists for Latinx scholars who are trained to engage policymakers, to engage, trained to engage the media, and also social media to tell a story that will help to expand and decenter the conversations about religion and to expand and decenter conversations about theology, where Christianity is the one that observes and those outside become the object. So that what we can move away from and decenter the dominant white agenda and perspective that is commonplace in the academy. The HTI may already be doing all of this, and if this is the case, then I celebrate with all of you tonight. But we all know that there is always more to do. I will end my observations with a comment. When I was director of the HTI, there were very, very few Latinas in any kind of leadership position within the, within the ATS Academy. If the men were scarce, the women were almost non-existent. This has changed somewhat, and there are currently HTI women graduates who are moving into administrative positions where decisions about hiring curriculum are made, but they remain too few even in 2021. While no Latinx organization working in the area of theological education can change this, what we still need is greater and more visible support of our women leaders by Latinos themselves. One thing I would always talk about at every meeting of HTI awardees was the need for community and solidarity with one another. The academy, is not created to function that way. And I challenge those early HTI students who were finishing dissertations, who were beginning to write their dissertation, to always look around the room and notice who was missing and then ask why. Why we had so few women, why the Latinas did not enter doctoral programs, and if they did, often did not graduate, and to question what was really going on. No matter where you are in your career, tenure, full professor, or you hold a chair in your institution, you're an administrator, or are just beginning your doctoral work, you can offer support and help to a Latinx colleague and you can make a difference. I believe that then and I believe it now. I would tell those HTI folks all those years ago what I will repeat to each of you tonight. Remember, this is not about you, this is about us. We are here and we have gotten here where we are in our careers because someone gave us a hand. Someone offered advice. Someone listened to our complaints. Someone offered to advocate for us. Someone showed up when we needed them. What has been done for us must be done for another. This was the essence of the kind of KHTI community I wanted to help create. An ecumenical community that crossed, the, that, that, that crossed the denominational lines that was inclusive of everyone, but that also had decided at its heart, in its core, that it would be in solidarity with one another. Again, I believe that back in 1996, and I believe that even more today. If we all indeed inhabit one oikos, 
If we are indeed all members of one household, then we are called to support and to help one another, to celebrate one another and to help one another thrive. This is the challenge. This is an ecumenical vision because an ecumenical vision is also about inclusion and justice. And this ecumenical vision, this aspect of that vision is one that I will never give up. So, adelante HTI, muchas felicidades y adelante, que hay mucho trabajo que hacer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daisy. It's always good to look back in order to move forward. Daniela is gonna offer some thoughts on one of the topics you mentioned, Pentecostalism. Uh, muy bien, y buenas tardes y noches a todos. Uh, greetings from Tenochtitlan, uh, AKA Mexico City, where I just arrived for another stint of uh, research. Um, I'm really uh, appreciative of the opportunity and the honor to speak at a Duke-sponsored event. It's uh, Durham as a place in my heart, of course. And uh, the Divinity School in particular, I found to be uh, a wonderful laboratory for ecumenism and uh, meaningful gestures uh, back and forth across the confessional divides with Methodists being the interlocutors between say Catholics and, and Pentecostals. Uh, so, uh, and I am so excited about Edgardo taking leadership there. Um, in 2011, I was invited uh, to Rome to uh, be an observer of the opening round, opening session or year of the sixth round of the International Catholic and Pentecostal Dialogue. Uh, I was invited as a skeptic uh, by the uh, Pentecostal side, uh, and the host was the then Bishop of Raleigh, Bishop Burbridge, Michael Burbridge. And um, it was an amazing week uh, to be there, a fly on the wall with an occasional opportunity to offer some comments. But as I uh, flew uh, into Italy, I couldn't help but think of my two abuelitas. Uh, one of them, uh, Cipriano Gonzalez, uh, a, had built a Catholic a mission and chapel in Solana Beach, California. And um, she was uh, uh, gone by, uh, by a decade by that point. But I just imagined her in her tomb, uh, fingering her rosary and thanking La Virgen that her grandson was finally making it uh, to the eternal city. My other grandmother, my paternal grandmother, was a pioneer of the Iglesia Apostolica of the same town, Solana Beach, and she had uh, passed uh, much earlier and had produced preachers, uh, trained preachers, and uh, also strong laymen like my father. And I imagined her in her uh, tomb, uh, uh, clamando la sangre de Cristo, uh, that I would be kept away from the horror of Babylon while, while I was uh, on this trip. Uh, so I have a very personal uh, experience here between two faith traditions, the Pentecostal and the Catholic, that are constantly on my mind and I've tried to work out. Uh, so my following com my comments are, uh, want to uh, take as a background the general notion that Philip Jenkins and others have explored about the shift of the seat of gravity in global Christianity or world Christianity to the global South. Uh, we, we, we've we're familiar with the argument and then of course uh, HTI in particular is strategically placed to appreciate how the global south is present in the global north through migration and uh, reproduction and fecundity. So I am going to share my screen just to help me think through some of the issues I want to lay on the table um, as we uh, go through this. Is that okay, good. Uh, I'll leave it there because I'm very clumsy when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, given the demographic shift in Christianity's seat of gravity to the global south, um, I think we need to keep in mind uh, the disastrous experience of Chevrolet uh, many years ago in which they tried to sell their Nova model under the same name in Latin America. Perplexed would-be buyers heard Nova in the made in USA and European model uh, of automobile. And sometimes I wonder if the ecumenical model that we are insisting that folks from the global south uh, 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 implement uh, is not um, 
undergoing the same problem. It's not selling very well in particular corners, especially of uh, the Pentecostal Latino community. And perhaps some reassembly in a religious maquiladora uh, may be required. And there are several features of the current crossroads of Latin American religious practice and the challenges and opportunities it poses to the ecumenical question. One is the church's continuing struggle to recapture, and this is the Catholic churches, continuing struggle to recapture lost terrain from the state and the invocation of public squares and religious spheres. Two, the persistence of popular belief and practice, sometimes with the collaboration or co-optation of official church authorities and sometimes in spite of them. Three, the endurance of the cult of the saints, especially Mary or Guadalupe, with its features of reciprocity and multivalent meanings, and for the porous boundary lines of religious culture and the shared substratum of religiosity that undergirds both popular Catholicism and Pentecostalism. To take the fourth point, for example, the difficulty in tracing precisely the dissemination of most religious choruses and hymns suggests that these ride in the luggage and the hearts of a very mobile religious proletariat that often does not bother to check in with ecclesiastical and aesthetic authorities. Their dissemination, performance, and multiple meanings remind us of the permeability and elasticity of liturgical and confessional borders and ecumenism of the road. And I want to get back to that uh, a little later. And what follows, I hope to elucidate these avenues of popular exchange and appropriation through which religious meaning is transmitted across confessional lines. I do so, however, being careful to note the several social or institutional strata in which religious exchange is or is not taking place. That is the hierarchical, the national, the diocesan, the local, and the popular. Let me talk about this here now. It should be evident that the religious ecology that we inhabit or that we study is vastly different from that one in the global north in which the Pentecostal Roman Catholic dialogue has occurred for the last five decades. As any horticulturalist or farmer knows, ecology matters. The same plant may not flourish equally in different environments. The Ecumenical cooperation, say, between Lutherans and Catholics that we saw at the end of the 20th century was the outcome of a long process of accommodation between relatively equal ecclesial institutions embedded in secular nation states in late modernity and comprised of increasingly indistinguishable flocks. The convergence noted by scholars like Mark Knoll also floated around shared ideologies patriotism, and political projects. And that's something we're seeing in both the United States and Latin America today. The contours and dynamics of ecumenism in Latin America also reflects regional, national, and subnational particularities. Perhaps the most striking general difference from the US is the asymmetry of power between Catholicism and Pentecostalism, especially in terms of institutional prerogatives and access to levers of power and influence. Put simply, there are higher stakes, political, social, economic, at play in Latin America. Both parties are playing for keeps, at least at the elite level. Catholic hegemons are seeking to keep and recover power and Pentecostal upstarts are keeping no prisoners and are increasingly invading the public square. And inasmuch as Latin America continues to bleed over into the United States, the Latino community presents a unique hybrid specimen for careful study, one that reflects at once the more open ecology of the US and the less tolerant niches of Latin America. And I think that's HTI's special uh, unique position uh, to play. Now to the several strata uh, that I mentioned. First of all, the institutional hierarchical. We can gauge the ecumenical commitment of prelates and other leaders by tracking their conversations, declarations, and actions over time. In over half a century of existence, the Consejo Episcopal Latinoamericano has met five times. And the last one was at Aparecida with Pope Benedict and one of the main organizers was um, uh, Cardinal Bergoglio from Argentina. And it's obvious from the history of documents of the conclaves that the uh, Vatican II's gentler nomenclature concerning separated brethren did not cross the Atlantic 
uh, easily. And as late as 2007, then at Parecida, we had statements such as the following from the prelates. A large number of Catholics do not know how to react to this religious pluralism in which they hear that Catholicism is just an individual option among many others, all of equal value in the global offering of religious models. In fact, in almost every country, the offer of the sect and religious groups is characterized on many occasions by an aggressive pros proselytism against the Catholic Church and with great frequency by a certain theology of prosperity quite distant, distant from the evangelical message. The defection of Catholics toward Pentecostal communities is not owing to a single cause. Among the most frequent that stand out are the sub search for subjectively more emotional religious expressions, the loss of contact with the church's evangelizing activities, even though these leave them with a thirst for a personal encounter with Jesus and with the word of God. You'd think that from that language, I would um, uh, continue my critique, but in fact, I think uh, it is long overdue to see a similar introspection on the Pentecostal side. We've had a century now of Pentecostal growth and lots of return, lots of intermarriage, and lots of introspection uh, called for. Um, but getting back to the different uh, dynamics at play here, um, put simply, the Latin American bishops have more to lose more power, more prerogatives, more status. And this is especially apparent in those countries where they are engaged in a life and death struggle for relevance and even ascendancy. After all, they are quoting none other than the Pope's, Pope Benedict's inaugural words at the Aparecida Conclave when they assert that Catholicism is the foundational bedrock of Latin American culture. Cito, el don de la tradición católica es un cimiento fundamental de identidad, originalidad y unidad de América Latina y el Caribe una realidad histórico cultural marcada por el Evangelio de Cristo. So remove the mortar and the building collapses. Can you imagine the U.S. National Conference of Catholic Bishops articulating such a position? Let me wrap up by being more hopeful. I do think um, there are several tasks that uh, are uh, uh, urgent for HTI scholars, um, for example, um, permíteme, I want to go down. We do have a, a, a wonderful uh, bench of uh, theological work that's been done, building on the work of Samuel Sullivan and Ellen Villafañe, and the important organizing work of Jesse Miranda. Uh, que pases cancer. But uh, I look to the generation of Daniel Costello and Sammy Alfaro and Erika Ramirez to um, be the think tank that uh, uh, helps us, uh, among other things, acquire a historical consciousness as evangelicos and as part of the Brown Church along the line suggested by uh, Roberto uh, Chao Romero recently. Uh, it's a wonderful book, The Brown Church, where he ties it all together from Bartolome de las Casas to, to today. Uh, we also have wonderful theological resources in fellow uh, travelers who have gone on to the main line, as it were. I think of Benjamin Valentin, Daisy Machado, and Saino Rodriguez as important uh, thinkers uh, that uh, would help in the maturation of Pentecostal identity. Um, but uh, HTI can only do so much. And I think uh, that is um, where our existential circumstances come in. And uh, let me go back to my uh, grandmothers. Um, when Nana Cipriana passed away in 1999, uh, I was uh, asked to deliver the eulogy and my brothers were asked to sing with me because in our clan, our Catholic Pentecostal clan, they look to the uh, Pentecostals to sing. We know how to harmonize. And uh, by then I had uh, learned in HSP and HTI circles that wonderful hymn, uh, Pescador de Hombres. And I shared it with my brothers who were struck by the biblicism of the text. And then Lewis, uh, the, the uh, keyboard player and arranger, uh, put together this quartet gospel version of Pescador de Hombres that our Catholic relatives had never heard. And one of my precious memories is uh, us singing that song as Nana's 
casket was wheeled into St. Leo's Church uh, and being uh, sprinkled with, with the holy water. Uh, the other moments were, there's a, there had a more recent moment when uh, I was asked to speak at a Catholic uncle's burial in, um, in Oceanside. And uh, my tia insisted that we sing her song, and that is Mas Allá del Sol. By this point in our clan history, all our Catholic relatives believe that Mas Allá del Sol is a Catholic song, que bueno, and uh, we, we, uh, we um, offered it. Um, and I think um, going to, getting back to this question here, whatever the hierarchies uh, may have to sort, of, sort out among themselves or uh, jurisdictions like dioceses and others or uh, parishes, I think it comes down to families and especially to those families at the periphery. And uh, an HDI colleague who was at the Oblate School of Theology was invited down to a service uh, at a migrant shelter in Tejas and was struck by the fact that the service was organized by Pentecostals. Uh, and there at that margin of that periphery, I think we are seeing an ecumenism of the road. Uh, we can call it the road to Emmaus uh, where they are comparing notes, they are breaking bread and they are finding their hearts strangely warmed without the theological apparatus that we would uh, seem to insist on. Um, I am hopeful about that ecumenism, as tragic as it is. Uh, I am fretful, as uh, Dr. Machado has uh, kind of gestured, uh, towards the other intersection where we're seeing uh, uh, political and religious ideologies bring together conservative Catholics, conservative Pentecostals around political agendas. And I'm not sure where that road is headed, and uh, perhaps through the critical work of HTI's uh, Pentecostal uh, scholars, we can uh, impact that direction. Muchas gracias. Dios me bendiga a todos. Mil gracias, Daniel, for the inspiring and provocative presentation. As Latinos, we welcome all voices, especially those from beyond the graves. So thank <laughs> you very much. Edgardo. Wonderful to be with you. Carlos, you know, mis hermanos y hermanas centroamericanos que tanto quiero que están con nosotros, Cristo vive y de verdad vive. Uh, so, I, I've been invited to speak with you about uh, ecumenism at uh, Duke Divinity and in Methodist Roman Catholic dialogues. Uh, both of these describe very well my own uh, aspects of my own biography. And so I begin by just saying a word, some words about ecumenism at Duke Divinity School. It's important to note that Duke Divinity School at its founding uh, was started as a school, the first uh, school in Duke University uh, because the indenture of Duke University charged that the courses at the institution should be arranged first, this quote from the indenture, with special reference to the training of preachers. And those preachers at the founding were Methodist preachers that they had in mind. And the Divinity School was started in 1926 as a school of religion at the time. And it was envisioned according to the founding language that its work should be conducted in quote, broad, broadly Catholic and not narrowly denominational uh, ways, unquote. So that there was a, a, uh, an ecumenical vision that was, in, that was baked in to the foundation of the Divinity School. And one that, we, that is, begins to be lived into fairly quickly, the second dean at the Divinity School, Albert Russell, was a Quaker, for example. This ecumenical commitment was uh, a manifestation of the Methodist and Wesleyan vision of uh, a Catholic spirit. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodists, uh, was someone who spoke often about the importance of a Catholic spirit, by which he meant uh, a love uh, for all of God's creatures, a love that sought to embrace all and to, and to, folk, and to um, embrace all and receive all because uh, all were made by God and made, were made for God. And this uh, Catholic love, this Catholic spirit led Wesley to embrace figures like uh, Gregory Lopez, a Mexican mystic, 
uh, from this, uh, the colonial period in Mexico as a, an exemplar of, of uh, Christian holiness, and also to write ecumenical uh, uh, statements and extend all the branches to Roman Catholics, as in his letter to Roman Catholic. And so this is a way of saying that for Duke divinity, it's, it is ecumenical because it is Methodist. And this uh, ecumenical commitment is embodied in its faculty. Think of people like uh, Robert Cushman, who was Dean of the Divinity School, 1958, 19, so 1971, and who was one of the official Protestant observers at Vatican II. And also I think of Teresa Berger, who was a Catholic laywoman and one of my teachers, who's, who wrote on the, on the theology in the hymns of Charles Wesley and, as, and looking for connections uh, in, the, in, the, in the theological richness of the Eucharistic theology of Charles Wesley's hymnody. And so Duke Divinity, an ecumenical school, and one that uh, has been in particular connected with uh, Methodist and Catholic dialogues uh, through, uh, not exclusively, but with those dialogues, but particularly with those dialogues through faculty members like uh, Jeffrey Wainwright, uh, who was the chair of the Methodist uh, Roman Catholic Dialogue for many years, and who was instrumental in working on ecumenical statements of the World Council of Churches like Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry, uh, personal friend of Pope Benedict XVI. He was my teacher and, and, uh, and teacher to a number of you who are on this call, uh, actually, uh, who came through Duke Divinity School. And so I, it was through the mentorship of Jeffrey Wainwright that I became involved in ecumenical dialogues, and in particular in Roman Catholic dialogues. Uh, Roman, uh, Roman, Methodist, Roman Catholic Methodist dialogues happen at the national level and at the international level. At the uh, international level, these are dia dialogues that are hosted by the World Methodist Council and the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. And these dialogues date back to the, uh, to the just after the, after the end of Vatican II uh, in 1960, uh, uh, 1967, and have been, meet, have been ongoing ever since. And I became involved in those dialogues in 2011, uh, which and, and a, a dialogue and exploration of the theology of holiness, uh, which led to the production of a text called The Call to Holiness from Glory to Glory in 2016. And it's exploring the theology of holiness of sanctification in Roman Catholic and, and in Methodist communities. And that's a, in the World Methodist Council and, Roman, and global Roman Catholic church setting. Then uh, we, I became involved in a, another set of five year, uh, these, these dialogues occur five year rounds, another set of dialogues around, the, around reconciliation and the significance of reconciliation. And it'll be published as a, the report will be coming out next year in 2022, titled God in Christ, Recon God in Christ Reconciling on the Way to Full Communion in Faith, Sacraments and Mission. There are also national uh, Roman Catholic Methodist dialogues that I've also had the, that, that have been going on for many years and in which I participated in the last number of years. One of those was on the topic of uh, called uh, the, uh, of Eucharist and Ecology, called Heaven and Earth Are Full of Your Glory, and that was published in 2012. And then most recently, one published last year in 2020, Catholics and United Methodists Together, We Believe, We Pray, We Act, uh, which was offering resources, commentaries on the, on the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the Love Commandment, and resources for uh, liturgies, for, uh, for, for weddings and funerals, of meth when in mixed families where there are Methodists and Catholics together in the same family. And so it's been a long journey, ecumenical journey. And just want to offer a, br some, a brief retrospect on this journey that's been, it's going on more than 10 years. Is, uh, there is certainly an experience of pain of separation uh, and separation that we experience particularly when it comes to communion and where we do not partake of the same cup. There have been reverses as the results of some of our 
our uh, reports are then are sent back to us when the official agencies look at them and say, hmm, you need to work on this some more. There have been lessons that uh, ecumenical work is not theological diplomacy, it's not a matter of uh, rushing down to the lowest common denominator, nor is it ecumenism of return. Uh, it's something different. It's about receptiveness to God's spirit. And there have been gifts, the gifts of celebrating, for example, the Jubilee uh, 50 year celebration of Methodist Catholic dialogue uh, in, in Rome in 2017. And I offer this as, as a way of them prefacing my some brief reflections, uh, opening reflections on Latinx uh, Hispanic Latino engagement with Methodist Roman Catholic dialogue. And I have three questions here. What does Latino Latina engagement contribute to Methodist Roman Catholic dialogue? What does uh, Latino Latina engagement with Methodist Roman, Roman Catholic dialogue contribute to Latino Latina theology and identity? And what does this engagement contribute to Duke Divinity School? First, to the first question, on what, it con what this engagement contri could contribute to Methodist Roman Catholic dialogue, I would uh, propose a, new, a renewed ecumenism. There's often talk about being in an ecumenical winter. I believe that engagement, robust engagement with Latinx uh, theology and communities would lead us to summertime and to a, and to a verdant and, more, and richer uh, engagement that proceeds not by dialogue alone, uh, but that shifts this dialogue alone to an ecumen from an ecumenism of the balcony to an ecumenism of the road, as been, has been mentioned already. It's not by in, in English only. There's, there's very little translated material of these dialogues into Spanish, uh, but and even less reception of that, but something new. I would venture a new we, a casa grande, a new ecumenism that occurs, if you will, in Spanglish where there is a new sense of the times and with that new questions and new discernment of the need to speak and work together. What this could look like, a few, a few, just a few uh, clues. Uh, uh, it, it could involve, I believe, reading the Bible and Nicaea in Spanglish. And by, and by that, I mean uh, emphasizing as, for example, the Hispanic creed does, the cultural particularity of the Incarnation, the encarnación, this putting on flesh of meat of Jesus. Uh, mestizaje mulates as marks of the church. The gift of lo cotidiano and the dream of the day of the great fiesta. So, so envisioning this contribution to, to a Methodist Catholic dialogue where we learn to pray in Spanglish with an expanded uh, uh, communion of saints of who is presente among us, a non-innocent history. It's common in Methodist Catholic dialogue to say that our history is not marked by division because uh, it's like grandparents and grandchildren because the Methodists did not separate from, Met from Catholicism but from Anglicanism. But that is not true in many of our lands. Many of us have experienced that pain that comes and the animosity that comes from Catholics and Protestants. So a non-innocent history and a new awareness with this of, of trespasses and debts and then acting in Spanglish and an ecumenism that is holistic, that involves walking together, involves sitting together, involves kneeling together, and that is preferential and located in the barrio. And then finally, to, uh, what does this uh, Latinx engagement, uh, or next tool finally, <laughs> engage, en engagement with Methodist Roman Catholic dialogue contribute to Latino, Latina theology and identity? I'd say a greater appreciation for the gift and beautiful limitations of denominational identity. At the same time, an increased sensitivity to the scandal of division, which is different than the gift of diversity, and hunger for unity that is different from unison, and paciencia ardiente, burning patience for the journey. Also, a sustained conversation between the Latin and Greek church fathers with the Latinx uh, mothers and fathers about today's challenges, and a living into the great commission for Latinx theology, which comes from, from the Comunidad de Fe to the church universal. And finally, uh, now that here I'm speaking what, uh, concretely from my location at Duke Divinity, what does this engagement, Latinx engagement, uh, Methodist Roman Catholic contribute to Duke Divinity? 
Duke Divinity is, is, is about to celebrate its, uh, its centenary. Uh, we were start, fought, founded in 1926. Uh, 2026 will be our centenary. And I'm convinced that the future of ecumenism and theology at Duke Divinity School needs to go south. Now by that, I don't mean going becoming bad. I mean precisely entering into our, our community experience. Uh, a community experience uh, the, which uh, is often seen as things going go, go south, they go badly for us. No, for us, for me, it's going home. And for me, it's discovering again the gift and strength of home. Uh, the, Robert Cushman, one of the deans of Duke Divinity School, characterized the first century of Duke Divinity School as marked by the experience of the World Council of Churches, Vatican II, and Selam in Medellin. My sense is that the second century of Duke Divinity School, if it's going to be a good century, will need to be marked by AET, HSP, HTI, and the faith of the Pueblo de Dios. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Edgardo. That was very inspiring. Thank you for sharing the gifts that you brought from the, not just from the official uh, Catholic Methodist dialogue, but also from your, your pastoral experience going to Pueblo de Dios. That was very, very rich. So the, the Cumulus of the Road continues now. And as Daisy mentioned, Christian unity can't just be self-centered and among Christians. We have to open it up and think about the relationship between ecumenism and interreligious dialogue. And with that in mind, uh, last but not least, we'll ask Manuela to offer some thoughts. Um, I um, have very much enjoyed hearing everyone's contributions to this uh, conversation. Um, and I have to admit, and in some ways, I, I, I find myself um, uh, as a, not an expert, um, as an outsider in, in, in some of this um, dialogue. And I think that's what, where I want to focus, or that's what I want to focus on tonight. Um, my own background um, is in religious studies and literature. Um, I teach at a public institution, and I'm a fairly lay Catholic, a fairly um, uh, lukewarm Catholic, as as uh, they used to tell us in 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 our um, catechism uh, classes in in Medellin, which is where I grew up. Um, when I came to the United States, I started studying Islam by accident and continued um, also by accident through a series of happy um, and less happy uh, coincidences. The first is that as a Colombian citizen, um, where I wanted to go study, um, which was Spain, because I was interested in uh, Muslim Iberia, um, was out of reach for me. Uh, there were no visas. There was no possibility for me to, to, to stay um, as, as long as I would have needed to in order to engage in the kind of research that is important in, in PhD work. Um, instead, my advisor, um, who um, uh, was and continues to be a very noted Moroccanist said, why don't you go to Morocco instead? And I think I paid $40. They sent me 10 back in a little um, check. Um, by they, I mean the, the Moroccan embassy in, in Washington, DC. And I, was, I obtained my residency in Morocco and was able to engage in my studies. Um, and one of the things that, that I wanna make very clear here um, as I speak to you all about interreligious relations between Christians and Muslims um, and um, historically between Christians, Muslims and Jews um, is that I'm not claiming to be the representative of any of these communities. And that um, is, uh, again, um, the, the focus of my small intervention tonight um, is what it means to be an outsider um, and in some ways representing without meaning to or wanting to, but being in the position of mediating between communities, becoming represent a representative of each community, depending on uh, the particular environment in which one finds oneself and doing that in, in, in the context of um, the United States um, post 9-11, um, but also the last four years um, have been especially challenging. So um, 
I don't speak as a theologian. I speak from within a religious studies perspective. Um, but, um, and I'm going to focus not on families um, as, as Daniel um, had discussed as the locus for the, the um, ecumenism of the road, but um, of friendship. So that's, that's a little bit um, uh, how I will frame the conversation today. So um, one of the very, one, a very noted scholar of interfaith relations in uh, medieval Iberia, um, which initially was the, the, the subject of my PhD dissertation, which changed later, um, is David Nirenberg. And David Nirenberg has noted that in the 14th centuries, but before then too, relationships between Muslims and Jews within Christian environments were very much shaped by the majority discourses that surrounded minority communities. Um, now, I tend to not want to draw too much, too many direct um, lines between the past and the present and to have these teleologies that, that seem um, inescapable. But I do think that that is something to keep in mind. When we speak of interfaith relations, when we speak of the conditions that make interfaith communities, friendships, um, relationships, marriages possible, the primary context, the hierarchies, the power structures, the institutions, and the frameworks that surround us um, very much will shape the possibility and the quality um, of encounters between different people, particularly between different minority communities. Um, that is very much been my experience um, uh, as a uh, sort of a cultural Catholic engaging with Muslims in the United States is that the quality, the possibilities of interaction between people of different traditions is very much shaped and mediated by majority discourses um, and by power hierarchies. And that is something that um, I hope um, that we can reflect on both all of us who work in, in um, public institutions, but also in seminaries um, and in different um, environments in which there is a stated majority position. What kinds of frameworks can we um, establish such that communities can interact in which ways? That, that has to be very deliberate. Um, so for me, um, I worked um, with in refugee resettlement for a bit before finishing my PhD, mostly with um, Iraqi Muslim Muslim refugees, um, but also um, that was the beginning of, of the Syrian conflict, and so um, quite a, a few different communities. Um, I've, I've worked um, in Albuquerque and Atlanta um, in that in that particular environment, and now um, here I find myself in in Tennessee in a religious studies department, being um, one of the few uh, Latin American um, professors teaching Islam. Uh, which is uh, an interesting position, but not an uncomplicated one. Um, it means that I am the representative informally of the Muslim community, even when I am not myself Muslim. Um, and it means also um, mediating between my own minority community and another besieged and persecuted minority community, which has, as has been the Muslim community in the United States. Um, it involves also oftentimes facing um, the different kinds of prejudices that can be um, inherent in, in our communities that also stem from uh, our religious backgrounds. Um, and uh, also encountering them in, in the community that we're trying, the, the, the community that we're trying to reach out to. Um, it also, as I speak about frameworks, one of the things that I have also realized is that when we speak about the quality of relations and the types of interactions that we have, um, because we're not dealing with a vacuum, um, the, even the way in which we speak um, about things like text um, or um, the way that we approach um, ritual or the way that we approach mediation um, is, is very much at stake. Uh, I'll always tell my students um, in my Islam classes that I do, I teach like a Catholic. Um, we don't read the Quran immediately. Um, we go through a lot of commentary. We, we work through ritual. Um, and that is often a shock, not to my Muslim students, but to my um, uh, Protestant students um, who find that approach to be somewhat um, different from what they expect religion should be. 
So even what, when we talk about uh, what is religion and what kinds of things that we are, are, are we um, trying to bring together, um, those are points of friction, not necessarily of encounter. We, we, we tend to um, assume that we can just simply sort of reach the other directly, but I think my experience and also my particular um, situation and, and, and positionality um, has very much led me to uh, think of um, relations as very heavily mediated by, by, um, by context. Um, so going back, for instance, to the concept of convivencia, um, one of the things that uh, I have tried to focus on, uh, uh, as many scholars um, in, in the Spanish-speaking world, so um, from um, Roberto Marín Guzman in Costa Rica um, to the school of um, uh, uh, Morisco studies in Puerto Rico, um, led by Luce Lopez Baralt. Um, there's there's a, a whole set of, of um, experts on, on this particular phenomenon, um, which is the interaction of Muslims, Jews, and Christians in, in, in Islamic Iberia um, or Muslim Spain. Um, one of the things that um, has been the subject of very heated debate is what exactly is the nature of this coexistence. When we speak of interreligious coexistence, is it prescriptive or is it descriptive? The, what kinds of um, possibilities are we foreclosing even in our imagining um, how communities should relate to each other? So I think um, I, I don't wanna take up uh, a whole lot of time and I'm, uh, I'm sort of afraid that I'm uh, gonna go over if I, if I just, keep on um, uh, sort of rifting this way. But I, I want to um, uh, emphasize the, 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 the model, the, the thinking of um, interreligious um, uh, interactions um, and um, uh, the quality of these interactions um, through um, a variety of perspectives. And so the first one that I, um, that I heard um, was institutional. Um, and so there have been um, a lot of very insightful uh, conversations here about how to um, better um, equip institutions, um, particularly educational institutions to engage um, in this kind of dialogue, especially as Latin, Latinas and uh, Latin Americans. Um, but also um, I'd like to, um, open up uh, the possibility of thinking about friendship and though the, to theorize what it means for different communities to informally, not through necessarily text or through the explicit mention of religion to encounter one another um, in a form of hospitality that doesn't necessarily depend on the dominant structures, um, but that can bypass them or can um, at least make a little dent in, in, in the, the restrictions that are imposed um, so that people um, can encounter one another. Um, it's, it's, I'll end with, with also like an invocation of, I suppose, the, the, the absent and, and, and the missing. Um, when um, I lived in Morocco, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, I didn't particularly encounter any, any huge uh, issues um, as an outsider. I felt much more at home in, in many different ways than I, than I have ever in the United States um, as a Colombian citizen. But the things that um, people find sort of uh, shocking about each other have to do with things like burials, um, how we bury our dead, how we take care of our sick, how we engage um, with those kinds of bodily um, uh, relations. And um, the most sort of honorable thing that that has that I've experienced in this kind of in, in this kind of environment has been to be asked to wash um, uh, the dead um, or someone's beloved. And that is not something that enters the academy. That is not something that we are prepared to do um, uh, in, in our particular PhD courses and in our classrooms, but it is something that we encounter in field work and in everyday life. I guess that is the ecumenism of the road. And so um, in those spaces of kind of between shock and horror and also delight and wonder and amazement um, lies possibility and um, I hope that we 
can continue um, discussing this further. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Uh, the path from Medellin to Morocco and then to Knoxville has allowed you to garner a lot of wisdom. Thank you for sharing that with us. And also your, your emphasis on the concreteness of the contemporary convivencia is a great challenge and, and stimulus to our thoughts. So we have a lot of great questions in the chat. Let me just go back to the very first one. Sami Alfaro had a question, maybe I'll pose to all four, if, if anyone wants to respond to it, or if all four of you like to respond to it. What are the greatest challenges to ecumenical collaboration we as Latinx and Latin American scholars continue to fight against interiorly and exteriorly? Entre nosotros y desde afuera. I noticed that Daisy put some emphasis on the interior conversion. Uh, would perhaps each of you like to say something about the greatest challenge in terms of interior conversion or even exterior conversion? The floor is open. Danielle. Well, I, I guess I would say we lack organic models. And much of our training uh, in ecumenical work uh, comes from uh, the outside, and uh, it's it's um, it's awkward imposition on on the Latino Latina reality. I think uh, presents problems. Uh, Yet on the other hand, we have exemplars of ecumenical generosity like Justo Gonzalez and Diego Elizondo, who, my God, they set such a high bar for gentlemanly respect for each other that I think it's been hard for folks after them to, to match. Uh, and, um, uh, but, but yeah, I think, I think just a, a, a lack of organic models. And there was a comment here about not enough uh, um, bibliography from Latin America. And I do think they're the work of the Fraternidad Teológica Latinoamericana and the Concilio Latinoamericano de Iglesias uh, would be very enriching for folks to know about and to absorb and to, to interpret uh, because we do have things going on down there that uh, we need to know about up here. Fabulous. Uh, I mean, we definitely need a more integrated approach, a more holistic approach. Anyone else on this question? I just wanted to say, listening to Manuela, that I was thinking about how we, uh, how do we decenter the the way that we do the work that we do with Christianity as a subject and the others as the objects, and I think this is a big issue that we have, right? And uh, as Christians, we don't talk about this, right? This is why I brought up the whole example of the United States as a Christian nation, the need to question that, because that has to do with us as well. You know, as Manuela says, it's sometimes harder to live here than to live in an Islamic nation, right? And we know that the implications, and that's a sad statement to make. Uh, and I think that when you're talking about this interior, it is interior or, the, you know, interioridad that you're talking about, Peter, it's, I think it's a challenge to us in terms of our scholarship and the work we do in the classroom to, to, to question what does this mean when Christianity continues to be the subject and other groups, whether they're Christian or not, especially the non-Christian groups, are objects. And how do we question that? So that for me is a, a big challenge for us. To, uh, and as one of somebody wrote in the chat, this is very different from the what was happening ecumenically in the 1990s, which is what I talked about. We're not there anymore. So what does it mean now in the 21st century, given la trayectoria, right? All of this way that we walk. And still, in many ways, uh, in este camino que Daniel talks about, right? We're still stuck. You know, we're not, we, we, how much have we really moved forward anyway? Thank you, Daisy. That's very helpful in terms of looking forward. I want to turn to Jacob uh, Leal's question, because a couple of people hinted at, uh, you know, questions about hegemony and search for equality and more openness to religious pluralism, but no one spoke, at least I missed it, if you did uh, directly on the question of the indigenous. Do the indigenous voices fall through the cracks? They're not really ecumenism. It's not uh, interreligious. Um, I have some thoughts on this myself, but would anyone like to speak about where the indigenous fit into this matrix that we've been discussing? It's a hugely important question. Manuela, any thoughts? Sure. Um, no, I think that that's, 
there's there's a couple of things that 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 um, I was thinking about, and it's a, it's a it's a wonderful question. Um, I think um, working from I mean again from a religious studies perspective, the big question that we always begin with in the classroom is what is religion, right? And the moment in which we set that boundary around this this analytical category. Um, then um, also sort of frames the dialogues and the relationships that are possible, right? So it, it, when we discuss interfaith relations or ecumenical, or ecumenical um, interactions, what is the goal? What is the outcome that we're trying to seek? Is it is it a, a, a joint um, for with with indigenous communities? Um, is it a joint political vision? Is it a, a shared sense of justice? Is it and um, what what role does um, uh, the definition of religion um, play in, into that shared vision? Um, I think one of the things also that that falls through the the cracks um, in there's been wonderful work done on uh, Latino Muslims by Harold Morales over at Morgan State, um, but and in 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 Colombia on um, Afro Muslim communities and anti blackness. Um, uh, seems to be also a, a kind of looming concern um, that really stops anti-indigenous uh, prejudice and also anti-blackness um, are, are huge, huge um, problems um, uh, for any kind of encounter that or that, in, that impede any kind of encounter. Excellent, thank you. Any other thoughts on this point? Well, I think we'd have to keep indigenous agency in mind. Uh, a lot of the studies of change in Latin America uh, stay at the national level. And so they'll, they'll contrast Catholics with non-Catholics and uh, where Catholicism seems to be holding its own up until lately in Mexico, uh, uh, folks uh, neglected the subnational. And the deep dark secret is the indigenous Americas are slipping away from the Catholic church. And that is where the expansive growth of Pentecostalism, Adventism, the uh, Stigos of is is happening. And we have to accord these folks some agency as they uh, like their ancestors of the 16th and 17th century negotiate their, their identity vis-a-vis -vis this uh, new uh, propuesta religiosa. Que, que están encontrando. Uh, and uh, one of my research topics down here in, in Oaxaca was the pastoral indígena de la Iglesia Católica, 19th century and earlier. Uh, and it's a fascinating topic to see it uh, perennially, perennially uh, relived and revisited uh, from both sides, from the religious institution and the missionizing agents and from the and from the religious communities themselves as they negotiate. And uh, one of the case studies I uh, returned to was the, the case of an expulsion, the expulsion of about 50 uh, Pentecostals from a Zapoteco village in the Sierra Juarez of Oaxaca. And, uh, and it played out over two years as they sorted out uh, their, their essentialist understanding of themselves uh, and came up with a modus vivendi that, uh, that uh, allowed uh, both sides to, to uh, understand themselves and, and live together uh, in a convivencia uh, that was actually brokered by the state of Oaxaca. But uh, uh, the Andes is another uh, area where you're seeing these, uh, these uh, changes among the Mapuche in Chile. And I think uh, we need to uh, consider the agency of these folks as we go about our work. Well, with that, I have to mention that Rocio Cortes Rodriguez, my student, just wrote a dissertation at Notre Dame on the Mapuche and, and dialogue with both Muslims and Catholics. But at any rate, I'd like to go on to the comment by, there's two comments from Ricardo Corto Moreno, three actually, uh, but in particular, coming from the recent uh, engagement with World Council of Churches, his question, if the growth of the Protestant evangelical church is in the global south, and the historic denomination churches that started the ecumenical movement are declining. Why are the ecumenical institutions in North America and Europe uh, still dominated by white folks? Why is there still ecumenical institution in, in North America and Europe still dominated by white folks? Would anyone like to touch that? It sounds like a question for a future dean, I think. Let me respond by fantasizing. Uh, about uh, the two groups meeting each other 
So uh, when I was in North Carolina and, El and in the Midwest, uh, I've seen instances where declining aging white congregations, uh, mainline, are uh, renting to thriving, uh, noisy uh, immigrant uh, Pentecostal ones. And you can tell the change from the AM service to the PM service. Uh, in my, uh, my wildest fantasies, I would love to see the two groups meet each other and the, uh, the group with the social capital, i.e. First Presbyterian Church of uh, wherever, uh, uh, mentor the, uh, the other group and uh, equip them to take over the real estate and to, uh, uh, to embody this change in global Christianity that we're seeing, but with the social capital and the wisdom that the mainline can provide. Uh, and of course, it would be a challenge to get uh, immigrant Pentecostal groups to overcome a lot of their iconoclasm, a lot of their sectarian introversion. But I, I think it will be a match made in heaven that uh, folks like HTI uh, can, can broker. Maybe Thank you, you Daniel. Go ahead, I Ricardo. Uh, it, in terms of the, why are things the way they are, this this is the the history that we are that we have inherited, and that we are struggling to uh, transform in the history of colonialism, uh, the, and, and the associations of the ecumenical movement and and and, and global denominations with uh, colonial expansion. At the same time, I would say that things are changing, and it, and and I have seen that in my in my time in in ecumenical dialogues where the, the membership uh, is increasingly coming from, uh, say in, in, the, in the global dialogues, the, members, the members of the dialogue are increasingly coming from outside uh, the Europe and the United States. And also that's with diversity in terms of geography and also in, term, and in terms of gender as well. There are uh, at the same time, have to acknowledge that it is very slow process progress, and that even as the membership changes, is uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the content of the conversation changes immediately, because uh, the agendas for the, and the questions and the topics are still being uh, produced from uh, certain po portions of the church, and moreover, vetted by those portions, and so that, for example. If we are gathering in a dialogue and produce a report uh, that you have to produce a report that will also be received, and it's it it, it means that it's a challenging process, it's a slow journey, and that's why I do believe this matter of that we're in this for the long haul, and that we got into this hole, uh, and it took a, it, over centuries, and it's going to take a, a long time to get through this. It won't be uh, even when I say fifty years of Methodist Catholic dialogue. I mean, that's uh, a drop in the bucket when it comes to the history of division that we have. And so it doesn't surprise me that it, that it is slow. Dialogues. I will also emphasize that bilateral, multilateral kind of dialogues are only one mode of ecumenism. I think it's an, I happen to think it's an important mode, but it's not the only mode. Uh, there are other things that are happening that are very, very important. And, and I think this matter of different models is true. Something I've seen in, for example, El Salvador with a group called Mujeres Ecumenicas por la Paz, Ecumenical Women for Peace, that includes uh, uh, Protestant wi uh, women, Catholic women, even some uh, uh, cloistered sisters of St. Clair, which is, uh, and all of them working on, to, uh, on ecumenism for the sake of peace in their country. So it's not just ecumenism for the sake of ecumenism, it's for the sake of a witness, a common witness. And so I think that the, I think that is crucially important too. And so and I and I'm sure there are more things like that that are happening. And this is part of the work of the spirit. And it's and I'm uh, again just privileged to be have my own little role in some of these conversations. Thank you, Edgardo. So maybe to conclude, I'll give everyone an opportunity to respond to this point that Francisco Herrera makes about the importance of difference between technology and changes in virtually every category of difference. A vibrant sense of mestizaje is taking shape, not only among the Latinx community, but 
in all of the United States. So we have here not just a difference of denomination, which can be both uh, a blessing and a gift and also a challenge, but interreligious difference. And then many of you highlighted socioeconomic difference. And then of course, with the challenge we face in terms of racism and responding from our own traditions against racism, maybe each of you uh, as a concluding mark could, could talk about a challenge of difference we still need to face. Who would like to begin? I'll, I'll take a, a go at it. Um, well, that thank you. And I, I think this will probably be the my concluding remark. So thank you all for, for listening to, to us speak. But I think um, as far as, as mestizaje, um, one of the things to remember, and this is back again, um, thinking about convivencia, um, that I am always cautious of is there are different ways of defining how how different things come together. Um, so we've also in Latin America begun to in, in Colombia, for instance, there have been discussions about mestizaje as a um, uh, a way to whiten to um, minimize difference. So it, as we speak of melting pots of coexistence, um, oftentimes those can also be mechanisms of power to um, quelch difference, um, especially uncomfortable difference. So I think there are, there are very different ways of framing this, but even within that, that the how we look at things coming together, um, there's there's something, something to think about there. Um, and I think that that's, again, the, the issue of difference is, um, how much of it is comfortable, how much of it is uncomfortable, how far to the center are we pushing ourselves and are we pushing people? And is that the only way of having um, uh, an encounter? Are there possibilities of going around the margins um, and um, dealing with those uncomfortable differences um, uh, head on, um, at least in some way. Um, and in those, in that manner, I do think that informal um, friendship-based approaches that can be kind of unconventional can also be incredibly useful and instructive. We see it in historical um, documents, those anecdotes, you know, uh, of you know, three people who were from different traditions went together into a uh, fundoc or a a, a hotel, a hostel, um, and what happened. Um, those um, can be um, wonderful and uh, illustrative moments of possibility. Thank you so much, Manuela. Anybody else on the challenge of difference? Daniel? I. Yeah, I uh, have to wonder again, or just question the model uh, where it's come from. Uh, and are there not others that would be equally as uh, productive? In, I have in mind the Black Church, uh, where um, ever since, uh, goodness, well, forever, uh, they've been able to gather uh, and empower each other and compare notes across the confessions. And we have this notion of the black church uh, and they don't need to ask anyone to decide what to do. Um, and why is it that we cannot talk about a brown church? And uh, again, Roberto Romero's uh, provocative book, I think really uh, opens it up. In, in, in new ways uh, for folks to, to think about uh, engagement at the organic level that doesn't have to check with headquarters, uh, especially uh, Anglo uh, headquarters. Uh, now I was raised uh, to be fair in a very Latino uh, corner of the church. The, the apostolic Pentecostal movement has been Latino led since Azusa Street, uh, the revival in 1906. So uh, as I have encountered colleagues and friends along the way, uh, the, the angst that uh, uh, Latino colleagues uh, experience as they negotiate with hegemonic white structures has always been uh, interesting to me. And I've always wondered, uh, what if we were to uh, just be a brown church among ourselves and, and, and get things done? Um, on the uh, last question posed, I do think uh, the intergenerational dynamics uh, are going to unfold in interesting ways. 
and are unfolding, uh, perhaps youth will loosen the confessional anchors that uh, prevent them from getting to know each other. Um, certainly they can go and find uh, anything they want today uh, and not have to listen to the ancianos. Uh, but I also think there's a danger in that, in that uh, youth will be blown about by winds of doctrine and uh, there will be no anchoring identity that uh, older generations can provide and through the wisdom of experience. Uh, but I do think we are at a crossroads uh, where uh, this will be perhaps a, uh, uh, such a question, uh, it's a question they, they wonder why we're asking because this is the way uh, youth live today. Thank you, Daniel. Edgardo or Daisy, a final thought? Just following on Daniel, uh, I, I'm um, reminded of this line in Pope Francis about the future being built from the visions uh, of the young uh, together with the dreams of the old. And, I, and that is, I, I, for me, a very compelling uh, I, uh, uh, su suggestion and very fruitful one for what I hope will be the case uh, as we uh, continue to journey together and 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 wrestle. We have young people on this call, and you have visions that will that will that are very important. And we have some not so young people on this call, formerly young people on this call, uh, who have dreams as well. And and I and this is, I believe, that in that sense, a Pentecostal moment uh, for the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, uh, doing something new. And that the sil and that this uh, silver uh, 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 anniversary of the HTI. Is also the fruit of the, of dreams, and who knows what other dreams uh, the, the the God will give through the Spirit uh, to us who are here and others uh, for uh, for the for God's pueblo. Thank you, Edgardo. Daisy, you were there when the dream for HI was first came to fruition. Do you want to give us uh, a final uh, thought? I'm, a, I'm afraid that I can't be as optimistic as my colleagues, so I'm just going to say Amen, Amen, Amen. Muy bien dicho. Gracias, uh, Daisy. I want to thank our presenters for this excellent uh, and robust and challenging discussion that we've had. I want to thank everyone who participated. Uh, just my final thought is that uh, remembering about the importance of friendship that Manuela emphasized and how also we had a really interesting discussion earlier uh, this year on an ecumenical discussion on Fratelli Tutti in which we recall that it was the friendship between Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar that inspired him in part to produce that amazing document. And that was something that bore uh, ecumenical fruit in our own discussion. So keeping in mind that friendship has to be concrete and that it has to be daring, I think there's, there, is, there is a ray of hope, but we have to live it in lo cotidiano. That's one thing I take from this discussion. So thank everyone. I'll give uh, Alma and Joanne a chance to say goodbye if they wish. Do um, you have any final words, Alma or Joanne? Yes, thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining us and thank you to the presenters for an amazing presentation. We have a lot of work to do. Just to clarify, older people continue having visions. So don't stop having visions. Yes, thank you all. This has been an amazing, amazing evening. As we say, in H, you know, we've started to use the word in conjunto a lot. And this 25 years have been the realization of dreams and hard work of so many contributors from the beginning. And we're gonna trust that just like the first 25 years gave important fruit to the ecology of theological and religious education and much more than that, that God, this is God's work. This is God's work ultimately, and that we're gonna trust that. We're gonna remain hopeful. We're inviting you to continue to stay in touch with HTI through its Facebook and its journeys. We have another lecture this year, and we had one in March that was recorded. So if you'd like to listen to that one, it is available and it was put on the chat. So again, thank you all for joining us this evening. Stay well, stay safe, and stay blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, and thanks to Catherine for working behind the scenes. We really appreciate yes. it. Yes, thank you all. Bendiciones, buenas noches, hasta la próxima. <laughs>